Welcome to Radical Feminist Perspectives. The webinar will begin in a couple of minutes. <clears throat> well, not less, in, in a few seconds. Today, we have um, the book Against Our Will by Susan Brown Miller and the uh, another book, Mass Rape, edited by Alexandra Stiegelmeyer. They're both books discussed by Sheila Jeffries and Dorothea Anison. Um, thanks very much and uh, welcome Sheila Jeffries and Dorothea Anison. Thank you, Joe. Uh, hello, everybody. It's lovely to be here to talk with you today. And I'm talking about these books with Dorothea Anison, who says she is a radical feminist from the UK, who's glad to be taking part in sharing these ideas with women around the world. And I'm very pleased to be talking with her. So uh, the books, uh, um, I suggested these books for discussion today because I was concerned about the rape and murder of women that's being carried out by Russian forces and their allies in the invasion of Ukraine. At the moment, uh, the war is still going on. So we don't have feminist analysis of what is going on now, but we will do so. Um, and I thought, thought we should look at some texts that were useful in um, enabling us to maybe understand what's happening. And the first is Against Our Will. Um, this is um, from 1975, Susan Brown Miller's book, which starts with a devastating chapter on rape in war, uh, which I think crystallized the feminist understanding in that, at, at that time of the issue. And then there's Mass Rape from uh, 1994, which is a collection of pieces on the war conducted by the Serbs and others in Bosnia in the early 1990s. Now, the, the, I think what's important to recognize is that uh, Susan Brown Miller's book didn't come out of nowhere. Uh, rape was a hugely important issue in the US in the early 70s for feminists. And there was a lot of theorizing about it and activism about it. And the first widely known feminist analysis of rape was Susan Griffin's uh, article called Rape, the All-American Crime, which was in 1971. So that kind of raised and framed the issue in the beginning. But Against Our Oil was the first full length book treatment of the issue, and it was hugely important. But two feminist books we should remember were published in the same year. The other was The Politics of Rape by Diana Russell, a very, very important uh, feminist researcher who died a couple of years ago. They're very different books, but in tandem, they created the fundamental feminist understanding of rape that underpinned the rape crisis movement and all the feminist work uh, against rape in the succeeding decade. Uh, Russell's book was, um, was different because it consisted of interviews with the women victims. That's what she did in all of her work. It was a technique at which she was expert, and it conveyed very well the meaning of rape for women. Uh, and it should be said that in, uh, against our will was so important that in 1995, the New York Public Library selected against our will as one of the hundred most important books in the 20th century. Uh, Brown Miller herself was influential in the earliest feminist groups of the late 1960s in the US. She's still alive, she's 87 years old. I enjoyed her memoir of her involvement in feminism, which I do recommend. It's called In Our Time, Memoir of a Revolution. I'm very glad she did a memoir because too few feminists do that. And they're really hugely important for us as well as very enjoyable to read. I first read Against Our Will soon after it was published, as soon as it reached the British shores, I guess. I was a newly minted feminist because I only got involved in the movement in 1973. Rape was the issue that galvanized what became the radical feminist movement against men's sexual violence against women. And it was, of course, mainly radical feminists or what became radical feminists who were concerned about this issue. It had a huge impact on me. Uh, when I moved from London to Leeds in 1978, which was the time that the so-called Yorkshire Ripper, Peter Sutcliffe, was killing and murdering women in Leeds, I joined the collective which was setting up the Leeds Rape Crisis Centre so that I could put my understanding of rape into my activism. Rape more than any other feminist issue of the early women's liberation movement, such as sexual objectification, 
represented by the Miss World content, for instance, uh, was the issue that we saw as going to the heart of the problem, certainly as radical feminists we did, because it showed that men as a sex class were involved in an unacknowledged violent war against women. Now, what I'm going to do is to hand over to uh, Dorothea, who is going to give us an, uh, an introduction to the contents of Against Our because I do suspect many do not know it. The book was 46 years ago, and I think there are women who don't even know right now that it exists. Yeah. And I must admit, I was one of the women that didn't read it. I was too young to read it when it first, first came out. And maybe by the time I was getting into feminism, sort of about 10 years later, it's maybe its moment had passed and there was new things um, coming out. But what struck me in reading it was that is actually a lot of the ideas were very familiar. Um, because you, know, you can tell reading it how influential it has been on feminist ideas around rape. You, you know, some of the quotes I've, I've seen, you know, in, in other um, documents and just the, the whole ideas about, you know, rape myths, uh, rape culture, how the legal system fails women are the fundamental sort of an understanding um, that feminists have. So it's a really comprehensive account of the um, impact of, of rape on, on women, looking at historical, legal, cultural aspects. And it's covering everything from, you know, ancient Babylonian laws and the Bible right up to the Vietnam War, which was contemporary to, to when she was writing. Um, so there's very, lots and lots of examples in there. Because we're pushed for time and because we're actually trying to cover uh, the war aspects of rape in more detail, um, I will give a, a quite a, a brief overview of it. Um, and it certainly is still relevant today because although there may seem to have been progress in, in some areas, um, so marital rape's now criminalised, which it wasn't when she, she wrote, certainly in the UK, but hardly any rapes actually result in any kind of conviction. Um, so it's essentially a crime that's still going unpunished. And one of the key ideas that she has in the book is that the motivation for rape is male power, desire for domination and contempt for women, which was challenging the idea you know, prevalent at the time that it was a, a result of men's sexual frustration if they, they couldn't find another woman or because they were psycho psychologically flawed and, you know, sick in, in some way. So one of the quotes that is actually, you know, sort of quite well known um, from the book is rape is nothing more or less than a conscious process of intimidation by which all men keep all women in a state of fear. And for many sort of feminists, this is a key insight. It's rape as a means of social control. It's not just a, a random crime of, you know, sick or deviant men. And it captures the experience that we have in being restricted in where, you know, where we can go, when we can go, and always having to sort of think and, you know, having the fear and having to sort of think about what, what we're doing. Now, the backlash to that is, of course, not all men that we sort of still hear um, now. But she shows that there's no, not one type of man who rapes. Um, so we can't tell. So we've got to assume that there is a risk. And that is still so important now because, of course, we're trying to defend our single sex spaces because of that reason that you know, men are a danger. So one of the main things that she covers is the legal system um, and how that fails to protect women. Because the crucial thing to understand about how the law deals with rape is that historically it was not seen as a crime against women, it was not seen as a violent crime, it was a crime of property. And the person that was, you know, sort of the victim in the rape in many ways was the, you know, the father or husband of the woman who was seen as her, her owner and he was the one that was damaged by, by the rape. It was his property, um, particularly if it was a virgin, you know, a virgin that was raped lost her value in marriage. And that's where you get the idea then that a woman, you know, should marry her rapist because nobody else would have her. And the idea that a raped woman is, is damaged in some way that she's, she's you know, sort of shamed and, and, and that sort of thing, which is still pre prevalent today, even though we've moved on from the, the clear sort of a property thing. It's still all those ideas are still very prevalent. Um, it, the law, so the law has always failed to protect women as as women. So she looks at some of the um, criminological work at the time, the crime statistics, 
Um, and that sort of shows that the sort of psycho view of the rapist as an inadequate repressed man, maybe with a domineering mother, because we have to blame women, um, you know, is, isn't accurate. It's, convicted rapists have normal psychological profiles. There's nothing exceptional about them. And they're often men that have committed other crimes, that they're, they're sort of brutalised and violence prone men who act out their hate against the world on the bodies of women. So it's saying that, you know, yes, you know, rapists are normal. There's nothing exceptional about them. Um, many rapes are planned and many are gang rapes, which is a, a male bonding ritual that, you know, they can prove their masculinity to each other. But the only rape that's taken seriously by police is stranger rape. Um, but they still assume that women lie. So it's still not taken seriously. And you know, the police are hostile to all, all women except the very young and the very old. Everyone else is assumed to have been, you know, responsible in some time. Um, if it comes to a trial, it's her word against his and juries are very suspicious and want corroboration uh, or they will blame women. You know, she's been drinking, she was hitchhiking, she, you know, went out for a date with him. Um, you know, the rape accusation is seen as easy to make and hard to prove. So the other thing that she looks at is sort of myths and um, culture and how they influence our understanding of rape, you know, starting right from the Bible, uh, but then persisting in, into to sort of current times. And the example she gives from, from the, the Bible is Joseph and Potiphar's wife, and she cries rape when he spurns her advances. And it struck me that in the UK, certainly, I don't know about other countries, there's a musical based on the Joseph story and they perform it in schools. So right from being very young, we're, we're getting absorbed into this idea, you know, of rape, that rape, women lie, that it's, you know, it's, ev it's everywhere around us. Um, so the other sort of influence on understandings of rape that's been very damaging is psychoanalysis. And I think we've mentioned before how psychoanalysis has been so damaging to women um and this wasn't particularly Freud himself this was actually women that followed um his his um teachings who said that women are masochists they have rape fantasies and therefore they make hysterical and false accusations <clears throat> excuse me so she she identifies what she calls the deadly male myths of rape. And they're still, you know, although she wrote this in the 1970s, these are still doing the rounds. All women want to be raped. No woman can be raped against her will. She was asking for it. And if you're going to be raped, you might as well relax and enjoy it. And I'm sure we've all heard variations um, on those. Now, her reply to it, I think, is very good. I shall, I shall read it out. Do women want to be raped? Do we crave humiliation, degradation, and violation of our bodily integrity? Do we psychologically need to be seized, taken, ravished, and ra ravished and ravaged? Must a feminist deal with this preposterous question? So <laughs> she just dismisses that. So uh, that, that's very good. So one of the things um, I think was important at the time was her saying that rape is to do with power not just sex. Now, later feminists say, you, you can sort of say that it's both sex and power, it's not. But I think at the time, it probably was important to say that it was power because at that time it was just seen as a sexual thing, which kind of does underestimate the, the, the impact on, on women. And she points out that some rape, although all rape is an exercise in power, some rapists have additional power. So, for instance, they have a status or the part of an institution that enables them to rape. Um, <clears throat> she mentions therapists and celebrities. We can think of many more that have been exposed, like, like priests and teachers and many, many things coming to light, though it still carries on. Um, and that the greatest abuse of power is the abuse of children, um, which is still denied and disbelieved despite women coming forward and giving their accounts. Um, the ones she sort of mentions are, are from biographies of, uh, of famous women, Virginia Woolf, Billie Holiday and Maya Angelou, but obviously there's many other um, women as, as well that have had that experience and, and been dismissed. Again, Freud, you know, is, is one of the guilty parties here. He was um, 
seeing women patients who were giving accounts of abuse in the family and he dis dismissed and denied it. He claimed that these women actually had sexual desires for their father and it was it was guilt and fantasies about that. And again, um, sort of Freudian psychoanalysis has blamed children for having seductive behaviour, which is absolutely ridiculous. Um, yeah, but it still goes on. I mean, in the UK, the um, child sexual exploitation gangs have been exposed and men have been um, convicted for that. But the police failed to act for many years because the girls were dismissed as coll colluding with their so-called boyfriends, even, the, the, even though these were adult men and these were teenage girls, or even um, they, they were labelled as child prostitutes, which is absolutely ridiculous rather than, than rape victims. So what it kind of shows is an ongoing sort of total lack of empathy um, with children, with, with girls and, and women more, more generally, um, you know, which is showed in, in sexology and psychoanalysis and, and everything. And she, what I think is a good point that she makes is it shows that the incest taboo, which is supposed to be the foundation of, of sort of civilization, isn't actually effective because, you know, girls are being raped in families all the time um, and that it's overruled by the right of the father which is, you know, it's still very, very powerful. So all of this is showing how rape is both endemic and normalised. And there's little rape risk for the rapist. The chance of getting conviction is, a conviction is minute. And she shows how rape suffuses popular culture and entertainment. It goes all the way from Greek myths, um, you know, through to James Bond, uh, fairy tales like Little Red Riding Hood, glorification of Jack the Ripper and, and other sort of sexual murderers. It's a common plot device in, in Hollywood movies where it becomes trivialised, glamorised, and it's just in there for titillation of the, of the men. Even books by women have um, women falling in love with a, a powerful but tender rapist. But what she says with Shunik is really good, that this rape fantasy is man-made. Feminism can destroy it. Uh, and I hope it, it can start to do that. And she finishes the book with proposals on dealing with rape, which I think are, are not particularly strong. They're, they're, very, they're reformist. She's making suggestions like, you know, if you put 50 percent um, of women in all sort of parts of the legal system, the police, the courts, everything that that, that would make a difference. But it's still a man-made system. Just putting women into that system um, doesn't necessarily change anything. Um, she does um, identify the need to end um, pornography that, that glorifies rape and violence, which she describes as anti-female propaganda. Um, but she doesn't really <laughs> talk about tackling male sexuality and you know, any of the things that radical feminists would see um, as, as essential to rape is sort of that reform in the current system. So that's a, a quick overview of what is actually quite a, a thick book. Um, <laughs> so I have missed out loads, but you know, never mind. Um, I just wanted to sort of give women that hadn't read the book a bit of a flavour of the sort of things that she she touches. So Sheila. Thanks. Thanks very much, Dorothea. Um, and, and I think you can see from what Dorothy was saying how much that's in this book is the very basis of feminist understanding of rape as it developed. Uh, and Dorothea mentioned the incest taboo and child sexual abuse. Well, I think that the, the, the crucial book on this is Florence Rush's book, The Best Kept Secret, which I think was uh, 1980, um, which is a wonderful book on how Freud invented the um, the unconscious and so on to, in order to pretend that girls had not really been raped by their fathers. Uh, maybe that's a book that we should look at at some time. It's a great book. Anyway, the, the, the history of how feminist ideas on different kinds of sexual violence developed is a really interesting one. Oh, somebody's asking in the chat, what book? Florence Rush, The Best Kept Secret. Great book. Um, so, it's a fascinating history as to how the, develop, uh, the ideas developed and developed from each other. Um, but, and I am a historian, so, you know, I'm a historian of ideas as well, so I find that really fascinating. But what I find interesting about this book is it was written before feminists were really uh, talking about relationship rape and date rape and coercive sex, the way men form, force women into sex, rape in marriage was not a big issue at that time. Diana Russell's wonderful book, 
rape in marriage came out a few years later where she interviews uh, women about rape in marriage and points out that um, one in seven women said they'd been raped with the threat of force by their husbands. Uh, but we don't have time for this, but I would say about that book, it is mainly about stranger rape, war rape, rather than rape specifically in relationship. Uh, but what I want, uh, but what's interesting is that Mariam Lutigliano, who's you know, involved in organizing these seminars, said when the book came out in America, there was a huge fuss because about saying not all men, not all men, as if this book showed all men. But in fact, that's not really what it con concentrates on, what happens in ordinary everyday relationships but mostly stranger rape. So what I want to go on to talk about is the first chapter. And it's interesting that she chose to do the first chapter on war rape, which suggests to me maybe she was galvanized by the fact that the issue of rape and murder of women by US forces in Vietnam, which was obviously a huge, huge, massive issue, was just coming out. Uh, brave journalists were starting to talk about it. Um, and it could no longer be covered up. So for, and maybe for that reason, that war rate, which was so shocking to US feminists because it was US troops, uh, was the first uh, issue in her book. Um, now, the interesting thing is that as a historian, when I was younger, in teaching history in schools, I taught wars of the 19th century in Europe, the First World War, the Spanish Civil War. But during all of that time, I had very, only very vague ideas about war rape. I didn't really know what happened. And for this reason, I think Brown Miller's first chapter on war rape, it was a revelation to me, a hugely important chapter. And I think probably a revelation to others who read it as well. We didn't as feminists know about this issue until the stuff started coming out on Vietnam. And now the chapter is mostly composed of a history of rape in many different kinds of wars, from the ancient Hebrews to the ancient Greeks to wars of religion in Europe in the 11th century, from the Crusades onwards and so on. And the first record she points out of war rape was of rape by German soldiers as they invaded Belgium in World War I by the historian Arnold Toynbee, the British historian. And she then covers the rape of Jewish women as the Holocaust was carried out throughout Europe. And when Ge the German army entered Ukraine, uh, different forces entering Ukraine now invading Ukraine. But when the German army entered Ukraine, they carried out a horrendous campaign of rape of Gentile women, including opening a brothel in one town and driving women into it and so on. The Japanese invasion of China is exemplified by what's been called the Rape of Nanking, but this use of the term was um, metaphorical. It didn't mean the rape of women, but the rape of women was horrendous in the so-called rape of uh, Nanking. Um, she also points out that the allies raped, uh, she says particularly so in the case of the Russians as they invaded Poland and Germany at the end of the war. But interestingly, Brown Miller suggests that rape by the allies might have been different from rape by the aggressors, which I think is kind of strange, especially because she knew about Vietnam. Um, in, instead of a reign of terror to destroy the will of the conquered people or reward the soldiers with the spoils, it might have been, she said, joyous, a sporadic, hearty, <laughs> spilling over and acting out of anti-female sentiment disguised within the glorious vengeful struggle, an exuberant manifestation of the heroic fighting man who is fighting the good fight. I, I think that's an extraordinary description. Why yeah, should the yeah. allies have been different and been joyous and exuberant? Yeah. And it wasn't joyous for the women, was it? <laughs> it definitely was not. So I, I just think that's kind of extraordinary. I went, oh! gasped when I first read it, and even when I read it again, it's extraordinary. Um, Brown Miller does recognize that the Americans are likely to have been engaged in rape, mind you, in World War II, and she quotes General George Patton saying, in spite of my most diligent efforts, there would unquestionably be some raping. So it was simply accepted that that would happen. The moment when war rape came into focus for the women's liberation movement, was in the very early 1970s over the invasion of Bangladesh by Pakistan in 1971. 
and also the Vietnam War. And for those of you unfamiliar with the geography, Pakistan at the time was a partition, it was part, um, was when the British left India in 1947 was in two halves. One half was on the west, one half was on the east. The Pakistani army from uh, when the um, eastern part uh, started to want um, liberation, they invaded. And it looks as if up to 400,000 women were raped. Many of them had children. They could not fit into the society, nor could the children and so on. Then in 72, Brown Miller was told by a US journalist who'd been in Vietnam about the scale of US, US atrocities against women. Um, one example is um, when in 1966, a squad of five US soldiers enter a village, they search for a young girl to take with them for five days of what they called boom, boom. As Brown Miller comments, it was understood that at the end of that time, they would have to kill her and hide the body. As they marched her away, her mother ran after her with a scarf, which the soldiers used to tie around her mouth. There are so many other examples of extraordinary cruelty by US troops, but I'll leave it there um, now. I think we have enough. Now, the chapter mm -hmm. ends um, but, uh, with Vietnam, but of course, there have been many, many wars since. Uh, and we know now that there was a great deal of war raid in the Congo, in Ethiopia recently. All of this is still going on. But the next example which galvanized feminists was what took place in Bosnia in uh, the early 90s. And Brown Miller's chapter was about the documentation of war rape rather than its explanation. But this book, Mass Rape About Bosnia, seeks to explain it. Um, and this, the collection was rushed out in response to the mass rape of women in Bosnia. Feminists were galvanized by the issue because of the extent and the brutality of the rapes and murders. And because this seemed to be the first time that rape had been used as a weapon of war so deliberately. And in fact, after the war, the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia declared that systematic rape and sexual enslavement in time of war was a crime against humanity, second only to the war rape, war crime of genocide. And although the International Criminal Tribunal did not treat the mass rapes as genocide, many have concluded from the organized and systematic nature of the rapes that they were part of a larger campaign of genocide. Many feminists have assumed that. Um, I shall concentrate uh, in, in terms of this book, we will concentrate, uh, I will concentrate on two chapters and then Dorothy will look at one. There's a, a chapter by Ruth Seifert called War and Rape, a Preliminary Analysis. And it looks at potential explanations of why these men behaved in this way. Um, Ruth Seifert says that war rapes were not about sex, but power. She says, one can say that the rapist's sexuality is not at the center of his act. It is placed instrumentally at the service of the violent act. Now, many feminists disagree with this now, particularly Catherine McKinnon. Be uh, what Catherine McKinnon says is that if you say that, that it's, it's power, not sex, this lets all the rest of male sexuality off the hook. And male sexuality is violent, aggressive, objectifying, coercive. It's not something wonderful that can be separated off by with dividing line from rape. Also, she says, it's sexual for the woman who is raped. So that say, to say that it's about power and not rape is a way of trying to sort of save men and male sexuality from an accusation that it's generally a problem. Um, and I agree with that analysis. So I think it is wrong to say it's power, not sex. Yeah. Um, I, think I think it's both. I think you can only understand it by... It's very definitely sex. It's very yeah. definitely sex because sex is about power. Male sexuality yeah. is about power. Pretty much always, I can't imagine, you know, when you look at pornography, you know, it's about power for sure. Um, so, it, you know, if, it, if it's not just power, but also sex, then the whole of male sexuality has to be totally reconstructed. Uh, that's what Catherine McKinnon says. That's my understanding, too. Uh, she says well, another explanation is warm. It gives men opportunities. Um, they, she says that men in a warfare have lots of... Um, Women in brothels, because the military generally sets up brothels. I've explained all of this in my chapter on military prostitution in the industrial vagina, where I look at uh, military prostitution in, in general. Um, so she says, but there, it, it, there's, there's more opportunities um, in war. Uh, she says that uh, war, because, of course, they're not uh, controlled in any way. They're not going to have any um, 
problems. Nobody's going to try and stop them or say anything. But that suggests that, that rape is, very, is about sex rather than power, if it's just about opportunity. She says that war rape is a form of communication between men. She says uh, it tells the men of the other side that they're not able to protect their women and they are thus wounded in their masculine, masculinity. Um, and this was clear, she says, when um, buses filled with women in their sixth, seventh or later month of pregnancy are sent back over enemy lines, usually with cynical inscriptions on the vehicles regarding the children about to be born. So the women were kept and raped and raped and raped until the point where the pregnancy was so advanced they wouldn't be able to have abortions before they were sent back. And in Bosnia as well, as in, uh, in Bangladesh and so on, these women got refused and excluded from their families, the children could not fit in and so on. But also it was seen by feminists at the time as a, as a form of genocide because it was actually impregnating so Herbs into the bodies of the women who were being raped. And that seems to be how the military understood it. Rapes, she says, reflect the offers of masculinity that armies make, which is that the armies train the men, this is my weapon, this is my gun, that's how the American army was trained in, um, uh, the, uh, um, in Vietnam. So the penis and the gun are uh, said to be pretty much the same. The, uh, the soldiers are in some wars actually trained with the pornography. An offer of masculinity that includes contempt for women is trained into uh, the troops. She says that cultural contempt for women um, is one of these uh, explanations. Uh, she says the background to rape orgies is a culturally rooted contempt for women that's lived out in times of crisis. I mean, one of the things that we try to understand as feminists at the time uh, when talking about the Bosnian war was that men who had been the neighbors living happily with their Muslim neighbors, would they march next door and rape the women and, and join in with these atrocities? How could that happen? Well, these were people from the same street. So what was it about the war apart from the lifting of controls that enabled these men to uh, rape the woman down the known road that they'd known for 20 years or whatever, but that did happen in the war in Bosnia. And cultural contempt for women, obviously, has to be a part of that. And what she says at the end of her chapter is, she says how extraordinary it is, the silence about war rape, the way that it's not written about, the way that we don't know about it. And she gives an example here. She says, um, at the end of the war in Europe, and I, I didn't remember this point, so it's good for me to go back and read it. At the end of the war in Europe, um, there were thousands and thousands and thousands of female aides to the German troops who were in Eastern Europe. And they, when the Russians got there, um, these women disappeared. 25,000, think of that, 25,000 female aides to the military in Eastern Europe disappeared at the end of the war. Um, nobody mm -hmm. looked for them. Nobody talked about them, so they were trash, I guess. Um, did they all die? Uh, we, we don't know what happened to these women. Were they all put in rape camps? We don't know about what happened to them. But that's an extraordinary example of the silence. Mm -hmm. Now, the, the other chapter that I want to talk about is Catherine McKinnon's chapter in this book. She has two excellent chapters, and Dorothy is going to talk about the other one. Um, She's got a chapter, her first chapter is called Turning Rape into Pornography, Postmodern Genocide. And what she sets out to say is that what happened in Bosnia is not so very difficult to understand if we understand the ordinary industry of prostitution and pornography in Western culture and, of course, throughout the world. Um, if we understand that extraordinary hatred of women that creates that industry and the fact that so many men are involved in that hatred, then it shouldn't be so hard to understand what took place in Bosnia because the men who carried out these rapes were trained by pornography and prostitution to engage in that extraordinary contempt of women. She does say 
that um, what took place in Bosnia was ethnic cleansing and it was genocide. That is her understanding as an international lawyer. Now, what she explains in the chapter is how the, the new technology of making porn videos, and of course there wasn't um, online pornography in quite the same way then, but it was used in this war to broadcast and make propaganda about the torture and rape of women. So the, uh, the rapes of women were filmed to make propaganda because when they were um, put out, it looked as if it was the opposite side raping the opposite side. So they were lying about who was doing the raping to make propaganda videos, which was quite a clever thing to do. But of course, they were also made just to stir up the troops and entertain the troops and so on. Uh, so she says that war rapes are simply an extreme example of what's routinely done to women. And she says, for instance, uh, the setting up of rape camps are similar to the ordinary everyday brothels of organized or tolerated prostitution. And indeed, I say that in, in my chapter in Industrial Vagina, that um, why are we making this distinction in the way that we do? And interestingly, it, it, uh, just this week, the Minister of Defense in Britain said that um, it would now be unacceptable practice for British troops to use uh, women in prostitution overseas, but not in Britain. Which is this wonderful, uh, extraordinary distinction that's made between uh, mm -hmm. domestic, which is, you know, uh, perfectly fine, and overseas where it's not fine. Um, so that, I think that makes a, an interesting connection between the military brothels and the domestic brothels. The domestic brothels are all right. Um, they can use women here in the UK, but it's probably not okay to be using women elsewhere. Um, and so there's this distinction made all the time rather than looking at the ordinary prostitution industry. Mm -hmm. But Catherine McKinnon does. She says it's all based on the ordinary prostitution industry at home. And this is where the, the, the troops are trained. I remember in Australia, one of my students, an older male student telling me um, who, that uh, uh, about uh, women being brought in to military camps in Australia. Um, and he was aware of the use uh, uh, and so on. So um, that's ordinary. Um, it, somehow, a war and rape and military prostitution is seen as worse than ordinary everyday rape and everyday prostitution. She, uh, she says, as it is in this war, prostitution is forced on women every day. What is a brothel? But a captive setting for organized serial rape. Um, now, the, or another thing that I found really interesting about her chapter in relation to what is ha happening in the Ukraine now is that, um, that not only, I mean, there are many echoes, I think, of what happened in the Second World War in Ukraine and what is happening in Ukraine right now. And what's, what's so fascinating about Eastern Europe, about, about which generally we have known not very much. And she says that the Croatian women who were raped in Bosnia were addressed by the um, Serbs who were raping them as Ustasha whores, um, which is a reference to the Nazi collaborationist regime in Croatia in the Second World War, which I think is very reminiscent of what's happening in Ukraine where Russia is saying that it's making a war against Nazis. It's the government is a Nazi government. I don't know what uh, vicious uh, ways they are addressing the women that they're raping there, but I suspect it could be quite similar to the Serbs calling the Croatian women Ustasha whores. So, so there, there's some very interesting uh, and unfortunate echoes here. Now, um, when she's talking specifically about pornography, she says that um, pornography saturated uh, Yugoslavia, especially after the fall of communism. What happened after the fall of communism was that Eastern European countries became the sources of prostituted women. A massive sex industry was part of the economic revival of those countries and the economic reconstruction, which is why, for instance, a prostitute women were often called Natasha's because so many Russian women were trafficked and put into brothels all over Europe. 
Uh, it's, it's Romanian women now who are in the brothels in Britain, for instance. So the sex industry accelerated massively. It was a terrible, terrible blow for women after the wall came down. And I have to say, back in those days, I was never somebody who thought the wall coming down was a good idea, Co controversial though that may be. But we can think about all of the things that have happened since, and particularly for the situation of women. Um, now, the ways in which she connects the pornography that they were looking at before the war and the prostitution and what happened in the war is, for instance, she says that some peacetime brothels have became rape and death camps. So, you know, they, they just crossed over from being ordinary brothels in Serbia or in Bosnia to become death camps. And she calls it a kind of surreal camouflage through blatancy, which I think is quite a nice phrase. Um, she also says that some of the brothels were animal pens and they had sort of fencing around them and win the open air. And that reminded me in Australia, where there's long been a, a legalized sex industry, um, that I was on a train going from West Australia to Melbourne and we were given a leaflet saying we could have a tour of the brothels in this you know, town on the way in the middle of nowhere. Um, and those brothels, it turns out, which were still in operation, still in operation, um, often consisted simply of walled um, fences around basically animal pens. The women were used outside in the animal pens. I think still at the time that we were going on this train across Australia. Uh, so uh, it's quite extraordinary, but I mean, nothing is new in that sense. Uh, that's the form of prostitution in Australia, one of the forms that was going on ordinarily. Now she says that survivors in, from Bosnia reported that their torturers acted out what was in the porn magazines that they were using. For instance, women would be hung on walls from walls in chains. They had uh, whips used on them and crops used on them and so on. So what's very important about the whole chapter is to say, we shouldn't be surprised, it didn't come out of nowhere. The massive prostitution and pornography industries all over the world, and particularly in Europe, construct this behavior. And in fact, that, that, I think that, that that had a big effect on me because that's why I wrote the whole section in industrial of vagina, specifically trying to make that point. After the war, Serbia, she says, became a big center for trafficking and commercial rape of children, which is not surprising. So, okay, I'm going to hand over now to Dorothea, mm -hmm. uh, who's going to talk about the other, I think, very important Catherine McKinnon yeah, yeah. chapter. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the one chapter I'm, I'm looking at is called Rape, Genocide and Women's Human Rights. So I think it's a nice way to bring it back to, you know, we're here as part of Women's Declaration International, which is about advocating for, for women's, women's human rights. And it shows up some of the challenges um, that are faced in using human rights um, to actually protect women. Um, because she uses the situation of the, the Bosnian women to demonstrate sort of how and why human rights legislation fails to include and, and protect women. Um, she says women aren't specifically considered um, within human rights, um, so they're only seen as victim of human rights violations alongside men. So, you know, the example would say would be the Holocaust um, that, that, you know, affected both or uh, political disappearances in countries like Argentina. But what that ignores, you, you know, it's the, the women aren't then victims because they're women. They're victims because they're Jewish or they're opponents of the government. So the, the specificity of being female is is erased. And, and the really good point that I think she makes um, in in this chapter is that rape isn't just something that happens during war. Women are raped at all times in all countries, and that isn't seen as a human rights violation, and nor are the other things that happen, um, you know, prostitution, femicide, pornography. She says forced motherhood, which I think is very ironic, you know, given the, you know, recent ruling in America, where, you know, that, that sort of right to choose whether you give birth or not is not seen as a human rights it's seen as something that can be taken away, um, you know, and, and I could add other, um, you know, violations that are ongoing to, to <clears throat> against women, you know, forced marriage, FGM, um, aborting female fetuses, this is ongoing 
um, you know, war, war against women. And she asks, why isn't this seen as an atrocity, a, a human rights violation? Um, and there's a there's a good sort of um, passage on 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 page um, what one eight three, and she says, she writes, life goes on in a state of everyday hostilities. Women are beaten by men to whom we are close. Wives disappear from supermarket parking lots. Prostitutes float up in rivers or turn up under piles of rags in abandoned buildings. These atrocities are not counted as human rights violations because the victims are women and what is done to them smells of sex. When a woman is tortured in a prison cell, her human rights are violated because what is done to her is also done to men. It's a crime against humanity. But when a woman is tortured by her husband in her home, she is a woman, but only a woman. So I think that's the thing where you know, it's bringing back the sex into the power, uh, in, into power in, in looking at the, these atrocities that men don't want to face up, and even some women don't want to face up the fact that these are sexual violations, that there are human rights atrocities against women that are sexual and reproductive in nature. And that is distinctive and that is that needs to be considered as part of human rights, not just looking at things that are, you know, sex neutral, that are, you know, are, are done to, to people. Um, you know, so the torture of a woman because she's a woman doesn't count. And, and she says, you can't be a human being and a woman at the same time, um, you know, which, which is, is coming up now. We're having to continually remind everybody that we have human rights, you know, where our, our rights have been ignored and abandoned by, um, you know, international organisations like, like Amnesty that are supposed to protect human rights, but have come out in favour of, of prostitution and, and pimps and, 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 and gender identity and, and not sex based rights. So she says atrocities committed against women are either too human to fit the notion of female or too female to fit the notion of human. So we just don't fit because the things that happen to us don't fit the sort of the, the standard the standard template because once you bring in rape and pregnancy and things like that it gets too too messy and too confusing and it overlaps too much with things that happen to women every day. Um, and the male institutions, the male state, do not want to face up to those as human rights violations because it would just be massive. It would just change everything. So rape and sexual violence are formally illegal, but in practice they're committed. And it's relied on women to challenge this and sort of stand up for our rights and, you know, set up rape crisis centres, campaign for changes in the law you know, support women that are fleeing domestic abuse, all, all the things that are, are happening. And so she says the rape in, in Bosnia clearly exposes these failings, that it's seen either as only sexual violence, in which case it isn't genocide, it isn't a crime against humanity, or it's an ethnic crime, you know, of sort of Serbians against Bosnians, and therefore it's not a sexual crime. The, the, the sort of male imagination can't cope with you know thinking two things at the same time and think, seeing how women have actually um sort of experienced these things as both you know so yes it is a sexual crime against them but it is because of their ethnic group and you need to sort of fit, fit the two together another quote from page 186 rapes are not grasped as either a strategy in genocide or a practice of misogyny far less both at once they're not understood as continuous with the gendered war of aggression of everyday life. Genocide does not come from nowhere, and nor does rape as a ready and convenient tool of it. Now, attacks on women cannot defy attacks on people. And the other thing I think is interesting is that she um, says, because it's seen as a civil war, she sees that as an analogous to the way that crimes against women in the family are dismissed as just a domestic, you know, it's something we, you know, outsiders can't get involved in. It's, it's all, and then civil war is, is the same, it's seen as, you know, too complicated, a, a sort of, you know, fraternal um, dispute. And, and therefore the, you know, the outsiders can't get, get involved. It's all, it's all too complicated. But she says, really, you need to look at why these particular men, Serbs, are doing it to these particular women the Bosnian Muslims. Um, it's not, you know, you have to look at the, the specifics of it. 
So she finishes by looking at some of the implications for women's human rights more, more generally. And she's saying that men in international human rights bodies represent states, they don't represent women. And therefore they protect and identify with each other. And as states are sovereign, they're reluctant to intervene in, in other states, they need a good excuse. And how women are treated in any state is never seen as a good enough excuse. And also because it would expose them because you know women are badly treated in all states. So it's, it's not like, you know, um, you know, the UN or American can say, well, we're going to sort of deal with these human rights in this country over here by sending in a peacekeeping force. Every single country in the world is implicated in, in rape and violence against women. Um, I mean, interestingly, since she wrote this, America did try to justify its invasion of Afghanistan on the grounds of protecting women's rights. But of course, we know that was just a sort of cover. And in the end, the women have been abandoned and have just gone back to the brutal oppression um, under the Taliban. Um, so that was just that was just cynical. Um, but the complacency about what women do, what men do to women in peacetime extends to war. So it, it, there's a continuous sort of uh, aggression. Um, and therefore women have nobody to act for them because you can't ask the state to act for you because the state doesn't recognise human rights. With the state permits abuses against us. So where do we go? What do we do? Which is why we need to have our, our own movements. Now, the point she was writing, she was discussing about the proposals to set up uh, a tribunal to, to deal with, with rape and other crimes in Bosnia. And that was a step forward, but she was questioning how well it would actually work for victims, because we know these things often don't, you know, very aren't often very sort of sensitive to, to the needs of, of women. Um, and af after she wrote this, I mean, it was decided by that international tribunal that the rapes were a crime against humanity, not genocide, a, you know, a crime against humanity. And some perpetrators were convicted, but of course, many others uh, were not. It was only, it was only a, a few. But that was an important precedent. But it hasn't actually changed because women have gone, carried on being abused in, in sort of conflict situations since then. Uh, so sadly, it's, yeah, she was hoping it would be a precedent and never again moment. And sadly, but, but not surprisingly, it's, it's not. And what, one thing that I, I wanted to say is that moving away from McKinnon, something else I read, it, it was about... Um, one of the rape camps um, that was in Bosnia that was based in a hotel um, and, and it's discussed in, in the mass rape book. What we didn't say is there is a big chunk of this book that is actually testimony from, uh, you know, women survivors where they're recounting what happened to them. Uh, and, and one of the key sites of rape had been a hotel. This hotel has now reopened. It's, it's in the Serbian part of, of Bosnia. It's reopened as a spa hotel and tourists go and visit there. And um, Mona Etel Harwi went with a, a, a Bosnian uh, woman journalist to visit it and was sort of quite shocked that everyone was acting like, you know, nothing, you know, nothing was happened. Apparently some of the, even some of the furniture was still the same as when it was being used as a, as a, as a rape camp and there's no memorial. Whereas in, there are memorials to massacres against, like the Srebrenica massacre against um, <laughs> Muslim men and boys, quite rightly has a memorial and is commemorated, but the women are still forgotten about. So despite all this testimony and the effort of women to, to sort of expose what was, is happening, it's still just brushed under the, under the carpet. So that's not the most happiest way to, to end it. I'm not quite sure how, how we do get a positive note when we've been dis, discussing uh, rape and war. And all that. Thanks, so. thanks uh, Dorothea. <laughs> um, uh, when you're talking about that hotel, I'm thinking presumably women, and it's bound to be women cleaners, must have got the semen off the sofas and things in that hotel, especially mm. if the furniture is the same. Yeah. Um, but I do wonder whether those visiting the hotel are told this was its history to get them even no, more excited okay. about being there. Oh, they're not even told about it. It's no, not like in Australia where you get the tours of the brothels. No. Where... And, and ironically, it seemed to be a spa hotel with mainly women there. Oh, goodness me. Yeah. So they wouldn't want to talk about yeah. the history. Um, now, what, you're what you've been saying about human rights uh, reminds me of my dis despair at this point in human his in history, because in the 1990s, Catherine McKinnon and many, many other feminist legal theorists, particularly quite a few in Australia, 
very, very good ones, were writing about women's rights as human rights in all the different ways that you can imagine, including violence against women and prostitution and so on. It was huge. It was a massive movement. I've got a three very large volume set on my bookshelves about women's rights as human rights. Now, of course, there's nothing, 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 nothing. I think the, the thing about the Bosnian War was when it happened, there was still feminism, not as strong as it had been, but women had got into universities. They'd become legal theorists. There were feminists there prepared to do this work. And they were shocked at what was happening because they thought we're beyond that. There's all the world conferences on women uh, and you know we've had a, a, a convention on women's rights and so on. They were very shocked by Bosnia. Certainly by the middle 1990s, there were massive amounts of books on women's human rights. I taught them. I taught an international feminist book with loads about women's rights at that time. Those women, none of them are doing women's rights anymore. They must all be doing something else. Um, and there's nothing because, of course, feminism has been wiped under the carpet. And it's, it's an extraordinary thing to me that women's rights as human rights, which was so huge, I mean, so huge, and formed such a large part of my teaching has pretty much disappeared now. Mm -hmm. So we're in the stage now where what's happening in Ukraine and women have been speaking in, in the chat about uh, the trafficking that's happening, the disappearance of women that's happening. It's not happening at a time when there's a fierce and strong feminist movement to fight it mm -hmm. because there's been such a terrible backlash against us. Women's human rights are not on the agenda in the way that it should be. And as somebody's saying in the chat, look at CEDAW. Yes, the CEDAW committee is sort of losing sight of the fact that women are women. And there's all sorts of men's organizations working through it to eradicate women and so on. So we're in a very bad position to deal with what's happening in this war and what happened at the time of the Bosnian war. Um, I'm, is there anything else, um, Dorothea, that you want to no. come back and say at this point? No, I mean, there, there's a, a, a question here. Um, is there a rape culture in the UK today, given 70,000 allegations of rape by women in the past 10 years? I would say, yes, there is a rape culture, because otherwise, how would there be 10,000, you know, 70,000 rapes? It's, it's, it's still there, all the, you know, the, in culture, isn't it? Um, you, you know, you, how many television series, you know, detected ones, is it based around the rape and murder of a woman? You know, how many, you know, movies still have, you know, at least a, <laughs> a disguised rape of a woman as part of the, the plot? Yes, and so few rapes are, are prosecuted now, very few, very much, much fewer as a percentage than even a few years ago, mm. that you can, as some women have said, say that rape has been decriminalised in this mm. country. Um, and I think what we've been talking about, and I think some women in the chat are absolutely having this impression, is that basically the problem is a, a culture in which women are tubes they are women are fleshlights fleshlights are those tubes that men put their penises in to masturbate women have become these masturbatory tools and indeed in my new book i've got a section on what happens in marriages and coercive rape when women are having to do sex so they absolutely do not wish to women of all ages are having to do sex they absolutely do not wish to well in a culture of that kind where women are fleshlights what are you going to expect but the mass rape that we've been looking at in wars Anyway, I think uh, we have come to the end. Uh, thank you for listening to us, everybody. And thanks, yeah, Dorothea, thank for discussing these books with me. Thank you very yeah. much. Thanks.